and welcome to today's course, Brownfield Redevelopment. This is the on-demand version of the course that aired live on October 3rd, 2012. Please take a second to get familiar with your on-demand viewing browser. To the left-hand side, you should see the list of slides. From the Attachments tab, you can print out a PDF of the course notes for today to follow along with. You can pause the course at any time, fast forward, or go back to repeat new information. There is a quiz located on the la second to last slide of the course. You will need to complete this quiz in order to get credit for the class. The course today will look at brownfield redevelopment from a few different perspectives. First, we will discuss what qualifies as a brownfield and at how contamination is determined. We will look at why it is important to remediate brownfield sites and at the processes that are typically involved. We will discuss some of the environmental, economic, and social benefits of brownfield redevelopment and at how these benefits can best be achieved in a project. We will also look at how brownfield development fits into the LEED green building rating systems. And here's a look at our agenda for today. We will start with an introduction where we will look at brownfields and why they are significant. We will then move on to remediation, discussing what is involved in cleaning up a site and the associated costs and tax incentives. In Section 3, we will look at some of the lead credits that are relevant to brownfields. Brownfields comprise a considerable amount of buildable land in the United States. There are over 450,000 sites in the United States that are currently designated as brownfields, according to the Environmental Protection Agency. While these sites do pose unique challenges to developers, they also represent a large potential for revitalizing areas that are underused and can provide significant profits for the owners. The traditional association with a brownfield is an abandoned factory or other industrial site but there are many types of sites that may be considered brownfields. Any of the uses listed here could lead to a brownfield, and each will have varying levels and types of contamination. Once contracts have been signed, the developer can begin the remediation and building processes. This is the phase where all the action really happens. Once the remediation plan has been developed, it will need to be submitted to the proper authority or authorities for approval. This could include the Environmental Protection Agency, a local authority, or any organizations that are issuing grants or loans to the project. Additionally, the overall development will need to be approved for the intended uses and structures, just as with a conventional project. Because many brownfields are in more developed areas, there may be city or local codes that need to be acknowledged, or there may be historical pre preservation protections in place that will need to be considered. Once all approvals have been secured, the site cleanup can begin. This can include cleaning of the soil, surface water, groundwater, and can also entail removing hazardous materials from the site. In cases where the developer who is performing the cleanup is not the same entity who originally created the pollution, a state voluntary cleanup program may be involved. This can often limit the developer's liabilities with regards to any contamination that's discovered after the cleanup process has begun or residual contamination that remains after an honest effort at cleanup. 
The cleanup should be verified when complete by the body that originally designated the site as a brownfield or another approved regulatory body. Depending on the severity of contamination and the cleanup activities that are involved, it may be possible to begin construction while remediation activities are underway. A good construction and remediation plan will streamline the process, allowing for a shorter overall timeline. A reduced project timeline reduces construction costs and also allows the project to move into the occupation phase faster, allowing the owner a quicker return on their investment. As with any project, it is a good idea to market leases for the finished building from the start or to have a prospective buyer in mind if the owner will not be the building occupant. Most types of con contamination and remediation measures will need to be disclosed to prospective tenants or buyers. There are also different regulations in place for various use types. For instance, a residential zone will need to be more contaminant-free than an area that is simply set aside as open space. The project is considered complete once the construction is finished and the property is occupied. Thank you for joining us today. Here you can see the reporting information for the course. We can automatically report this course for you to AIA and GBCI. Simply click the link in the teal box to complete the course evaluation and auto-reporting form. Please note that when completing the auto-reporting form, you will need to give us the email address that is associated with your GBCI account. Again, Thanks for joining us and we hope to see you on future GBRI webinars.